In 1936, Betty Davis won her first Academy Award for her role in Dangerous. But for Betty, the award had very little to do with Dangerous. It was the Academy's compensation for a perceived wrongdoing. For the Academy, the award was about ensuring its future as it scrambled to define itself and appease its stakeholders. In this episode, we'll talk about a snub that scandalized Hollywood, the political context that caused the snub, and how the Academy atoned for its error by awarding Betty her first Oscar for the wrong film. When Betty Davis came to Hollywood, nobody really knew what to do with her. She had talent, but she didn't look like a typical movie star. Warner Brothers wisely picked her up knowing they just had to figure out her niche. The first few years of Betty's career showcased several failed attempts to mold Betty into a type. They tested every kind of persona they could from glamour girl in the fashions of 1934 to straight-laced professional in three on a match. Nothing clicked. Then Betty heard that RKO was making a film adaptation of W. Somerset Maugham's novel Of Human Bondage about a medical student who falls in love with a manipulative cockney waitress named Mildred. Many actresses, including Katherine Hepburn and Irene Dunn, believed playing a character the New York Times called a heartless little ingrate would damage their reputations with audiences. So they turned the role down. Betty saw the character differently, as an opportunity to play something grittier. She begged Jack Warner to loan her out so she could play Mildred. In her memoir, The Lonely Life, Betty wrote, I haunted Jack Warner's office. Every single day I arrived at his door with the shoeshine boy. After six months of cajoling, it finally worked. Warner agreed to lend Betty to RKO, assuming, like other actresses had, that playing Mildred would ruin Betty's reputation. After all, better to loan her out and let her dig her own grave than to keep spinning wheels to find the right persona for her. But in playing the wicked Mildred, Betty stumbled upon her type. Of Human Bondage gave Betty her first big platform to play against audience sympathy, something she would come to perfect in films like Jezebel and the Little Foxes. The New York Times told this anecdote to highlight her effect. At the first showing yesterday of this picture, the audience was so wrought up over the conduct of this vixen that when Carey finally expressed his contempt for Mildred's behavior, applause was heard from all sides. Even though audiences hated Mildred, They loved Betty, the opposite of what everyone assumed would happen. The sheer intensity of her conviction made her magnetic. She didn't care if you thought she was evil or ugly. For example, as Mildred, she convinced director John Cromwell to let her apply her own makeup, as she later would in Baby Jane. If Mildred was dying, Betty wanted her to look like she was dying. It was a noticeably subversive performance, and audiences and critics couldn't help but respond positively. It seemed like she was a shoe-in for an Academy Award nomination, if not the win. But when nominations were announced, Betty wasn't on the list. Why? First, this category only had three nominations allotted to it. Fewer slots make the category more competitive to enter. Second, Warner Brothers, as Betty put it, seemed reluctant to take advantage of her tremendous publicity. Although Betty was their contract player, Of Human Bondage was an RKO film. Warner Brothers didn't believe they should push attention to a film made elsewhere, and RKO didn't want to campaign for a film that lost 45,000 at the box office. Furthermore, rumors spread that Jack Warner personally campaigned against Betty, who didn't feel that his problem child deserved it. Third, the Academy was mired in conflict with the Screen Actors Guild. Founded in 1933, SAG, along with the Writers and Directors Guild, accused the Academy of interfering with their capability to negotiate as talent groups with the studios. They sought more power for their union. And as an act of protest, both SAG and the Screenwriters Guild instituted policies that anyone joining the unions must resign from the Academy. As a result, the Academy lost over half its membership within months. That meant that the remaining voters were a small group of professionals loyal to the Academy and heavily influenced by producers, AKA Jack Warner. The failure to recognize Betty wasn't just a snub, it was a scandal. It caused such a furor that it marred the reputation of the Academy. Movie magazines filled with discussions about who really deserved a Best Actress nomination. 
One PhotoPlay article said, quote, even my postman lingered the other morning on the doorstep and pushed back his cap from a puckered brow. He said, my son and I have been talking about this academy passing up Betty Davis. It's a darn outrage. A similar but smaller outburst occurred on behalf of Myrna Loy, who was not nominated for her performance in The Thin Man. A quick side note, critics were similarly concerned that the Oscars had become too heavily influenced by studio politics and not the quality of performance. So they formed the New York Critics Circle Awards the following year in response. The Academy, fearing damage to its reputation and facing financial ruin in the face of mass resignations, responded by instituting a write-in option for the final ballots. So even if Betty wasn't actually nominated, she was still nominated. People could vote for her. Their website to this day lists her as a nominee. Betty lost the 1935 Oscar to Claudette Colbert for It Happened One Night. Despite that film's historic sweep of all major awards, the outrage continued on Betty's behalf. She once said, quote, My failure to receive that award created a scandal that gave me more publicity than if I had won it. Industry peers noticed this too and frequently wrote about it in magazines. Letters from fans poured in to express their grievances. Rumors ignited about the reliability of the voting process when the Academy released the order of votes received in each category, which was then a common practice. Betty came in third, Myrna in fifth. Ultimately, to quell suspicion, the Academy hired independent firm Price Waterhouse Cooper to count the votes for future ceremonies. So I guess thank Betty whenever we have the token moment acknowledging Price Waterhouse Cooper at the next Oscars. After the ceremony and the scandal, Betty returned to Warner Brothers and more roles she hated. Housewife, front page woman, the girl from 10th Avenue. And then came Dangerous, the story of a washed up actress, Joyce Heath, who constantly found herself involved in scandals. It's a clear attempt to recapture Betty's talent for playing bad girls. The trailer states knowing Joyce is like shaking hands with the devil. And then she has her token Mildred-esque cut him down monologue. The Dangerous received much less enthusiastic reviews. Betty spares no feelings in her memoir about Dangerous. Quote, it was hardly inspiring. It was maudlin and mawkish with a pretense and quality which in scripts, as in home furnishings, is worse than junk. But it was Warner Brothers junk, and this time they were prepared to capitalize on her momentum. Come award season, politics once again consumed the Academy. After two years of failed negotiations between producers, unions, and the Academy's labor division, SAG opted to boycott attendance at the 1936 ceremony. The Academy now faced A, pressure from the larger public who questioned their decision-making and importance because of Betty, and B, a specific stake in appeasing the acting community. Their first move, nominate six women for Best Actress. They hoped that would compel more actors to attend, the show would have more star power, thus prestige, and relations would improve. They were Elizabeth Bergner in David Lean's Escape Me Never, Claudette Colbert again in Private Worlds, Katherine Hepburn in Alice Adams, Miriam Hopkins in Becky Sharp, Merle Oberon in The Dark Angel, and Betty in Dangerous. Of course, Betty won, but she saw it for exactly what it was. It's a consolation prize, she wrote. This nagged at me. It was true that if the honor had been earned, it had been earned last year. It seemed that the Academy bowed to pressure in an effort to save face, and it worked. Even though everyone understood her win whisper of human bondage, the controversy was over. The underlying message of that win was, listen, we made a mistake, but we fixed it. Not a bad message to send when negotiations are going poorly and you need actors on your side. Yes, they wanted to do right by Betty, but there was more at stake than simply honoring a great actress for her work. Warner Brothers, of course, also had a hand in Betty's win. Their effort for 36 was tremendous, resulting not only in Betty's win, but also the only successful write-in win for Best Cinematography in Midsummer Night's Dream. Did Betty actually deserve the award for Dangerous? Probably not. She herself stated that Katherine Hepburn, who received the second most votes, deserved to win for Alice Adams. 
But 1935 was full of well-remembered performances that could or should have arguably been contenders. Jean Harlow in Reckless, Ginger Rogers in Top Hat, and Greta Garbo in Anna Karenina among them. Inadvertently, Betty found herself at the center of a time that would change the Academy forever. She caused the imposition of the write-in vote while practically pioneering female villainy in American cinema. Although they shuttered the write-in in 1937, the Academy added the supporting actor categories again to bolster its relationship with actors. Of course, Betty wasn't done affecting the Academy. Award in hand, she claimed that the statuette's backside reminded her of her husband's, so she called it by his middle name, Oscar. Whether or not the credit truly belongs to Betty for naming Oscar, 1936 was the first year the name was used. Consolation prizes aren't ideal, but given the amount of snubs Betty would later have in her career, at least they actually made up for this one. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much. Bye.